Hey, good morning. How's, how's everyone feeling this morning? Good? So-so? Good mix. Uh, glad to have everyone back for the final day of recon. We're gonna start the day off with a malware talk today. This is Juan, and he's gonna speak with us about uh, insights gain, studying uh, attacker APT dynamics in the wild. Cool. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, so my name is Juan Andres Guerrero Sade. Juan is fine. Whatever is easier for you guys, don't worry about it. Um, so we're going to talk about something I call mining the disputed territories. Um, did anybody here see some of the work on territorial dispute by any chance from the Shadow Brokers leak? Let me get a better sense of things. How many of you actually do like threat intel? I know there's a lot of reversers. I see a few hands go up. All right, so I know that I'm coming to your house, so hopefully we can do a little bit of an introduction uh, on Threat Intel without getting too basic, but I also want to tempt a lot of people that are really good reversers uh, to maybe give Threat Intel a chance. I know that it gets a pretty bad name, and it should in a lot of ways, uh, but hopefully it can also be interesting to some of you. So let's go into that. Uh, also, since I know that there are some government folks lurking around, maybe they woke up this morning, I will say that I'm going to talk about things that are adjacent to classified information, but I hope that you won't have to go like fill out any paperwork uh, because I put up a slide or something. So just that's my bit. Uh, all right. So threat intelligence in 30 seconds. Let's do a tiny bit of an intro, right? So. From a defender's perspective, you basically have way too many bad actors, like too many people out there trying to do damage. Um, you've got this uh, combined adversarial resources that are simply overwhelming. There's just too much happening out there in comparison to the amount of budget, people, resources that you have in-house uh, to try to combat that. And the number of possible threats or infection vectors, vulnerabilities, tools, general security issues, like the amount of things that you should be taking care of is simply overwhelming. It's the reason why we have like the CISO job, which is like the sacrificial lamb. There's no way anybody's ever gonna fix everything. So when something goes wrong, that's the person we fire. That's the whole point of that job. But that really shouldn't be the way that we manage that, right? So some folks will seek to address this with something they call threat modeling. Like, you know, if, you, if you're on Twitter for long enough, they're just like, well, just threat model. Uh, that's like the imaginary version of threat intelligence. You say, okay, you sit down one day by yourself and you're like, who could possibly target us? And it's like, okay. Uh, people can't possibly think about all the possible permutations and dynamics that happen. Like, you'll go into a hotel chain and they'll be like, yeah, nobody does espionage, we're just a hotel. Like, we get criminal actors. And then, like, it turns out that there was a government meeting in one of their hotels the week before, so one of the best espionage actors ever just so happened to be lurking in their network. Threat modeling doesn't really account for a lot of special dynamics. So, I tend to dismiss it a little bit. A bigger fan of threat intel in general. Uh, and by threat intelligence, what I mean is um, situational awareness of active adversary capabilities. Yes, everything is possible. Yes, there may be a million attackers out there. But let's talk about what attackers are actually active, what are they actually doing at this time, what have we seen them doing, and what can we actually counteract. So from the perspective of somebody that's trying to defend an enterprise, um, it actually means that you're going to devote what limited resources you have in meaningful ways, right? If you have five people working to defend your enterprise, or if you have five people in a company or whatever, um, they're not going to be spending all day trying to patch a bunch of things that aren't relevant, or they won't be trying to do incident response uh, for a bunch of small fires without realizing that there's somebody with a flamethrower on the other side of the field. From the perspective of a threat intel provider, somebody that actually you know, generates the reports and does this sort of thing, it means that you kind of have to be aware of all possible threats at all times. It means keeping track of them constantly. It means being aware of every development that they do. And at the end of the day, you still know that you don't know everything that's out there. It's this like horrible crushing pain of thinking that like, I will never know everything that's out there and I just have to keep trying and trying and trying, right? So, 
When it comes to unsavory data sources like leaks, especially government leaks, people tend to shy away from this sort of information. They, they sort of feel that there's something undignified about looking at it, and I agree to a certain extent. I mean, threat intelligence, the fun of it is the hunting. You don't want somebody to just come at you and you know, say, hey, here's all of government X's stuff. Well, that's not fun. Uh, however, every once in a while, you do get some interesting data sources that people should not ignore. Uh, like it, we talked about the Shadow Brokers leak, I mentioned it earlier. I don't really care about the malware that's in the Shadow Brokers leak. We did enough work on the Equation Group. I used to be part of Kaspersky's Great back in the day. We worked on the Equation Group for years. The hunt, the fun part was there. I don't want to look at the Shadow Brokers leak to look at the malware. But there are certain data sources in there that we should pay a lot of attention to. So that's what we're going to do today. So one particular opportunity there is we have hopefully the opportunity to fill in some gaps within the visibility of what threat intelligence thinks is active in the world or it's happening out there. Um, and we also have an opportunity to conduct a bit of a self-assessment. Um, and by that I mean there is no way to grade whether threat intel knows what it's talking about at all, right? Like how can you compare notes? We barely share information between the vendors. We can't go to the NSA or GCHQ or whomever and say, look, this is our list of actors. Is it like complete? Is it what you guys see? Like, do we have 40%, 50%? Like, they're not gonna tell you. So let's cheat a little bit and try to get a bit of a self-assessment, right? So I'm referring to something called territorial dispute. It's also known as Teddy for short. Um, what it is is a set of signatures that were leveraged, get this, on the boxes of equation groups targets to monitor for the presence of additional malware uh, on that victim box. So there's a lot happening there, just to unpack that. They're basically running AV-like signatures on their victims so that they know who else is on those boxes. So why would the equation group monitor the integrity of their target systems? Uh, for a variety of reasons. First of all, uh, to avoid collateral discovery. Um, to avoid fourth party collection, the people get a treat if they are familiar with fourth party collection, and for the purposes of deconfliction. So, for context, uh, each one of those things. First of all, Kaspersky discovered the equation group in the first place because of collateral discovery. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, there's a machine that when we were at KL, we used to euphemistically call the magnet of threats. Uh, it was basically a box in the Middle East where, if I remember correctly, there were seven threat actors at the same time. All kinds of interesting research happening on that box. Uh, but you go in to investigate one, and then you find another, and you find another, and you find another, and you find another, and then you find one driver that you're like, I've never seen this before. And that's a discovery of the equation group in the first place. From there, you get other issues like they reuse the same standardized but custom crypto library for 14 years, so you write one signature and you pull everything the equation group ever did uh, over 14 years. So collateral discovery, not a fun thing. Um, fourth party collection is also a pretty well established practice. Anybody know what fourth party collection is? Has heard it before? See a few heads nodding, cool. Fourth party collection is a very complicated dynamic within the space. For anybody that doesn't know what it is, it's basically when someone is hacking somebody, so you hack that first someone in order to steal stuff from that third someone. It's complicated as hell, but it is happening. And if any of you like really boring academic papers, you're welcome to read this that I published a couple of years ago on fourth party collection. But we're not gonna go into it today. Maybe in the questions. Um, and finally, the equation group wants to make sure that it isn't overlapping their targeting with friends or foes. Um, and that's, again, a very tricky topic, right? So why with their friends? It's something that normally, uh, the standard term for this would be deconfliction. You hear about it now with like humanitarian circles going into Syria, for example. You have to be able to tell both the Russians and the Americans, hey, we have a, you know, a ad hoc hospital here, please don't drop a bomb on it. It's a form of deconfliction. Similarly, you know, when you have allied forces somewhere in a theater or battle, you have to let them know, hey, we're gonna be here, please don't bomb us, we're friends. Um, similar thing happens with intelligence agencies running um, operations in cyberspace. 
you're not really gonna tell your friends who you're hacking. Uh, chances are, even within the same country, you're not gonna tell other organizations who your targets are. So it becomes kind of a complicated thing of saying, how are we not gonna overlap on the same boxes? So, like I said, intra or interagency compartmentalization uh, means that you're not aware of friendly operations. And that means that in order to achieve deconfliction, in order not to be on the same boxes as your friends, uh, you have a few different ways of going about this, right? Like you can agree to say, hey, you hack people who are into pedophilia, like child pornography, we like hack people that are into drug trafficking. That's still complicated though, because drug traffickers are also money launderers and so on and so forth. So it doesn't really work. Uh, so that really isn't gonna keep you from overlapping targets. So the other way to do it is as a means of verification, right? That's where we see this notion of like AV-like capabilities making its way into uh, some of the fancier malware. Um, I'm gonna write a whole paper on deconfliction, or I should have already submitted a whole paper on deconfliction. I'm a little late, but it will be published in October if you're interested in that specifically. But I figured that it being recon, we should focus on some of the technical side of the stuff, right? So let's talk about the signatures themselves. If anybody's familiar with Crisis Lab and, and um, Boldy's team, uh, they're amazing researchers. They worked, um, well, they discovered the first samples of Dooku. They worked on Flame or Skywiper back in the day. They've done a lot of amazing research of their own. Um, and they were the first to try to identify the territorial dispute signatures. Uh, so they were able to identify a lot of what are called the number signatures, right? You see SIG 1, 2, 3, up to 45. Um, sort of part of the problem with this is that the signatures themselves don't tell you what malware you're looking at. The government isn't using the same, you know, fancy cat, blah, blah, panda names that we're using in the industry. They don't care about that sort of thing. They have their own fancy names, but in any case, uh, this is what the um, numbered signatures look like as far as what Crisis could tell. I know this is really small. Don't worry about like reading it. You can find it on your own. Um, and what's interesting is from what sorry, from what Crisis Lab saw in territorial dispute, you've got some familiar names. You already see some uh, sort of prescient findings, but there's also some gaping holes. There's things that they couldn't find. So from in here, you can start to see things that you know we're pretty well aware of. You've got Stuxnet and Agent BTC, Turla stuff, um, Animal Farm, HydraQ, uh, yeah, uh, Flame and Mini Flame, and so on. If anybody's interested in Flame, we also just released some work on that a couple of months ago. Uh, beyond that, you also see groups that we are still dealing with to this day, which I think is sort of to the point of threat intelligence, right? People say, hey, you burn these guys, they're gone. Not really. People have been fighting with Turla for 21 years. Uh, you have Sophacy around very much so. They may have just retooled last year, but you know, Sophacy, Fancy Bear, APT28, the bastards that we dealt with last summer or summer 2016, they're definitely still around. Dark Hotel is still around and so on. Um, and then I'll point to a couple of names here that are kind of vastly underexplored, the Sunflower, Cheshire Cat, Flower Shop. Um, that's a platform that's been active in the Middle East for about 12 years and then sort of disappeared. So if you're looking to do some research, that's fun. Uh, so what about the gaps? What about all the stuff that's just question marks in there? Uh, and how do we go about trying to do a better job or uh, a more efficient job than what Crisis Lab was able to do? Because they're brilliant researchers. They didn't, you know, it's not that they couldn't do this because they don't have the skills. It's because, you know, they don't have the visibility per se. So what we're gonna do is take these signatures, which for the most part are registry keys or file names. They're very basic. Um, and we're hopefully gonna f feed them um, into a system that has enough visibility into just the right things. So given the age of these signatures, the registry keys are not really gonna be useful. Usually uh, from an antivirus perspective, you get to collect registry keys and other heuristic stuff when you're on those boxes. I don't have on box visibility. I definitely don't have it for things that are 10 years old. Uh, so instead, you know, we're going to focus on file names and related metadata so that we can craft some queries that actually work for this. So uh, being at a place like Chronicle, I was able to get away with generating a multi-terabyte database of metadata without anybody complaining about the computing and storage power for the time being. And um, we did that for the entire collection of virus total, right? So 
that means that we can actually start to uh, write queries based on que you know, um, information like this, right? You could, obviously, we care about the file names, but we also care about the age of it. We can kind of get a sense of when the signatures were deployed. So you can say, yeah, we would probably be seeing this malware five years ago. Uh, does it already have detections from other antiviruses so we know that it is bad or it isn't? Uh, what country does it kind of come from? What bitness do the files have? File type, sizes, et cetera. Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. It wasn't necessarily a much better job than Crisis Lab, right? So some of these signatures are just way too vague. Like some of them have overlapping file names with Windows components. You're not going to do much with that. Um, there's some that we just have no visibility for as well. So signature 1921, et cetera. We don't have the malware. We didn't collect it. Maybe it's that rare. I don't know. Others were a little more promising, uh, where we found the malware, but it doesn't look like anybody's worked on this subset of whatever that is yet. So possible research going forward, or if any of you are just getting into the space and would like some cool stuff to look at, signatures 31, 32, 41, I can tell you that they're in virus total. You can hit me up for hashes. I don't know what the malware is. I haven't had the time for it yet. As it is, some of the stuff that I want to release during this talk, mostly because it's 10 o'clock in the morning and you guys were kind enough to show up, um, some of it I haven't even finished researching, but I want to you know, just kind of present it for everybody. All right. So some of the stuff that was more interesting, you could say Signature 6 uh, is actually something called GREF or Airx or Lurker. Uh, presumably Chinese group that FireEye discovered a couple of years back. Turns out the NSA had been tracking them for years before that. Um, Signature 27 turns out to be the Lazarus group, you know, the all too famous, probably North Korean cluster of stuff that we have been researching since Operation Blockbuster in 2015. Um, and another subset of that called Dark Soul, which uh, has been doing wiper attacks in South Korea and so on for a long time. So it establishes the precedent of what we see with Sony Pictures um, eventually. So, okay, government was on to those folks for a while. So what's the score as far as like a general scorecard goes? Um, my slides seem a little messed up. There we go. Um, so the threat intelligence industry, for the most part, has caught up with the equation group signatures from 2010 to 2013. I'm sure that they're doing a much better job you know, going forward, especially as the private sector kind of gets into it. AV detection mechanisms are obviously much better than just having registry key file names, blah, blah. Um, but I will say that, okay, they have campaign, they have knowledge of campaigns involving some of these components. It's much more extensive than what we can see from the information that we have. But I don't think that that's, I don't know, that's not a fair assessment uh, of us, right? Like, we have a good understanding of certain types of campaigns and they do of others. Sort of mixing that up, right? Um, we still have components that we can't identify, so clearly we're missing things within this whole space. We lack understanding of certain malware family combinations, which, of course, if the government can see things from an incident response engagement, they're going to know that these two pieces of malware showed up in a defense contractor, whereas for us, we just see two pieces of malware, we have no way of, cor of correlating them, right? Um, and like I said, it's likely the result of incident response or their own um, sort of computer network exploitation of other boxes or all source intelligence, which you know they get to kind of leverage on their own, right? And I'll say this, um, our intelligence and our telemetry are not aging well. I mean, that's a concern folks share as far as like, you know, you have the Internet Archive because, you know, the Internet doesn't stick around forever. Things disappear, resources disappear. Reverse engineering resources disappear. You know, forum will go offline and all that knowledge is gone. The same thing is happening with a lot of this really valuable threat intel telemetry, right? A lot of it's been collected by private companies. Those companies go out of business. They get acquired. That information is gone. If nobody wrote a, a half-decent report about that stuff, forget about it. So it, it is actually a deep concern for me because I like doing some of this paleontology work of actually going back and looking at malware that's 10, 15 years old, right? Um, and yeah, like I said, it's proprietary and, and thereby nonlinear. Fine. Okay. But we're a recon. I don't want to bore you guys to death, especially 10 o'clock in the morning. So let's talk about some slightly cooler stuff. Let's talk about some malware. Um, and hopefully some interesting observations. There are things that happened in territorial dispute that got way less attention, but I think are arguably far more important. There's another file in there that I think is arguably more important. 
So there's a little file called driver list. It's 250 kilobytes. It is actually just 5,000 file names alongside operator instructions. So it's basically, if you see this file, this is what you should do as an operator working in the equation group on that box. It, it actually highlights this sort of acute paranoia of uh, cohabitating with rootkits, which I think is very interesting. It's most likely the result of a sort of pre-driver pre, pre code signing era, right? Where rootkits were a much more prevalent thing. But I think it also speaks to sort of what they figured would be a blind spot for them on these victim boxes. So what do you find inside of the driver list if you try to identify these 5,000 names? Well, you know, of course you find a lot of sort of Russian and Chinese groups. You also find what the government calls PSPs or personal security products. So, you know, Kaspersky, McAfee, so on. You don't want to be, you don't necessarily want to be on the same boxes as those. Um, and you also find commodity tools, like things like Nero or Daemon tools. You know, when you're just on a box and another driver shows up, like in that day and age, maybe 2010, 2012, you don't necessarily know what it is, and even if it's supposedly benevolent, you still freak out about it. So chances are that the equation group guys would have pulled back. So other observations from this driver list. Well, one thing is, if Kaspersky hadn't discovered the equation group in 2015, just dumping this file out there would have probably led to the discovery of about 60 or 70% of the equation group components which I think is particularly interesting. Like the shadow brokers benefited from the context of having like this sort of big threat intel release beforehand, but all they needed to do if they really wanted to screw over the equation group was just dump that one file. Another thing is, um, I might be using names that people are unfamiliar with, so feel free to just sort of shout at me. Uh, but, you know, Equation Group, which we equate with the NSA as far as Shadow Broker Slate goes, there's another group called the Lamberts, which people equate with Vault 7 and the CIA side of the house. Um, these two haven't really crossed in a lot of ways, but when you look at the driver list, there's something interesting. Uh, at least for Gold Lambert, for one of their components, we see them referring to it as a friendly tool. Please pull back. So this is a case of deconfliction where you can say, hey, these two threat actors are aware of each other. Okay, cool. Uh, that said, I'm gonna say that it's partial awareness of each, other op each other's operations because if you keep looking, you find Orange Lambert components, uh, the equation group doesn't know what they are. So it's not like the Lamberts are giving them a full list saying, hey, these are all our operations. It's just in some cases they've crossed paths and in others they haven't. So I think that's pretty interesting. Cool. But, you know, still irrelevant, still old, still not necessarily as technical as it could be. You'd be right. So let's, let's get into some ideally cooler stuff. So here's three things that I hope to um, go into with the time that we've got. Um, I wanted to revisit some of them. I honestly was not going to release some of them. I talked a little bit about it at SummerCon because I also got this, like, 10 a.m. slot the day after the party. So I feel like I need to kind of reward people for showing up. I do appreciate it. Um, so we're going to go into Signature 30, Signature 44, and 45, and into something that I like to call Torch Relay from the driver list. Okay, so Signature 30. This is actually what the signature contains, period. You've got one driver name, actually with no um, extension, and then you have three user land file names. Um, if you look a little deeper, you know, start to search around, it turns out that the one driver name is something that was called XFRL, which I find particularly interesting. And then this malware is associated to something, like they sign it with a name Shanyan Team. I, I believe it translates to John Doe Team, but I've heard from a lot of different people about all the possible permutations in Chinese dialects that this could be. I have no idea. Uh, the malware is pretty prevalent for about seven years. I don't. I'm sorry, I, I can't go into the Shanyan team now. If any of you want to do research into it, hit me up. Like, we've done some work into it. Um, but I'd rather focus on the XFRL rootkit, right? So, like I had mentioned before, the equation group connects these two, but we have no idea what connects them. Sort of delve deep into it, have yet to be able to figure it out. But we're going to focus on XFRL. And one of the reasons I want to focus on XFRL is this was discovered by the threat intel industry. Microsoft publishes a blog about it in 2010 saying, hey, really interesting rootkit, um, presumably found within a defense contractor. Uh, but then nobody's able to figure out anything else about it. We find maybe like six samples, 
and that's it. No one groups it into any particular threat actor. Nobody says what country it is. You know, people assume it was China, but no idea. And it just sort of lingers as this mystery. Now, what makes X4L particularly interesting, um, this sort of stuff taken from some of the public analyses at the time, uh, Microsoft noted is they implement their own TCP IP stack. It's sort of like this NDIS rootkit. Um, and then what it's doing is essentially using this sort of set of pipes to create processes, pipe into a command line, allow you to do whatever you want to do. Um, so Microsoft noticed it at the time. It turns out that the NSA also noticed it, and you know they, they roll it into this signature 30. So what's the benefit of going back to this thing you know, almost nine years later? Well, it turns out that X4L wasn't an isolated incident. Maybe at the time, people didn't have the right tools or the right collections to figure this out, but once we look at it from the perspective of sort of modern onlookers, uh, it turns out that we can find some other interesting things, right? So X4L had an installer, and if you pay attention to sort of the strings uh, of the installer, you might see that uh, they allow you to install the driver. They also allow you to unstall the driver. Um, in Thread Intel, we love misspellings. They tend to be fairly unique things. So if you write some signatures on these particular strings, we actually find another installer for a different rootkit. So this is where we start to kind of connect the dots to something else, right? So internally, um, X4L was referred to as X141, as you can see from some of the PDB paths left over. Whatever this other thing is, is X15, so presumably a following version of something different. So it's another rootkit. It's something called X Firewall that uses the same magic packets as X4L to handle some of the endis um, hooking and you know magic byte functionality that brings things alive. And when you signature on that, you actually find another rootkit. This thing called NTIO. There's you know about five or six different variants of it of something called Hide Server Rootkit. And then if you signature on that, you find another rootkit uh, called IP Capture that also does some interesting stuff on sort of uh, the Endis protocol level. It's VM protected in the same way that, that the um, X4L rootkit was and so on. So what? Fine. We find four or five different rootkits. Well, in hindsight, at least two of these rootkits were authored by the same person. Um, it turns out there's this nice website some of you might recognize called Putin, where uh, people in China share source code. Um, and this is the source code for X Firewall, and this is the source code for Hide Server. Cool, all right. Um, they're submitted by different accounts, but it turns out that they're actually supported by the same email. And if you look up that handle, uh, that dude is on Twitter right now. That's my main reverse engineering lead following him. I follow him now. I'm hoping he does something. Um, I don't know if he's behind X4L. All I'm saying is he's related to several rootkits related to X4L. So maybe ask him some questions, send him a DM, figure out what he's up to. Cool. So let's move on. Something hopefully a little more interesting, right? So everybody loves lawful intercept vendors. This has become a really popular thing over the past few years. Um, People have spotted things like Hacking Team. That was a lot of fun. I remember Nico did a fantastic talk here at Recon about Hacking Team back in the day. And then there's Gamma Group, you know, Finn Fisher and, and all those wonderful hits. Uh, but what about some of the more discreet lawful intercept vendors, right? So recently, NSO got a lot of attention because they did this regrettable public profile, right? They wrote this article saying we're amazing and then everybody just sort of like pounced on them, uh, which is what tends to happen. Uh, but there was also another company that decided to do a regrettable piece of PR, and I think once they saw what happened to NSO, they pulled the article back immediately. Like, you can find a cached version out there, but the article was on Haaretz for about, like, a day or two. So let's focus on what the NSA calls Signature 44 and Signature 45. You can see a series of file names here and, and uh, registry keys and so on. We're actually able to identify a couple of pieces of malware directly from these file names and sort of move on to other things from there. So we're going to talk about something that I called Richard Fish. Um, interesting things about Richard Fish. First, uh, some of the command and control uh, servers that they're using, the way that they've registered them is sort of reminiscent of other operations we've seen, like Flame, where they'll register the command and control servers with fake 
European identities and put addresses of like hotels in Europe or things like that where you know, you know, it's fake, but it doesn't immediately, it wouldn't hit a machine as fake per se at the time. Um, also, there are almost no detections for these pieces of malware. You can actually see Kaspersky calls one of these black mirror, which I thought was pretty interesting, but they're the only AV detecting some of these pieces at this time. So Richard Fish in a snapshot. So the good of it, they have some pretty decent fake registrations. They actually don't reuse some of those registration, that registration information, which is pretty good because we tend to be able, you know, if you make everything with this particular fake email and you use it for all of your command and control servers, we tend to pivot really easily into all of your command and control infrastructure for that operation. They also do something that some threat actors have gone on to more recently where you go single IP, like single VPS or whatever to single domain. So you don't have this sort of sprawling tree-like infrastructure that you can move on to. And more importantly, and more recently, that we've gotten obsessed with this idea of code reuse, where you know, we have all these tools to try to figure out if uh, you're using the same source code that you developed at a given time. Um, this particular code base for these you know, about 15 or 17 samples that we found has not been reused for anything at all since, as far as we can tell. Now, the bad side of it, Rudimentary obfuscation, just a rolling XOR and some single byte AND stuff. Uh, one, you know, single CNC, and I'll say it's autographed. And you might ask, what do you mean by that? But we'll get into it. So why might the NSA care about these backdoors in particular? Well, like I said, there was this article in January of 2019 called Candid Candiru, which you might be able to find a cached um, sort of uh, version of uh, discussing this you know, Israeli lawful intercept company called Kandiru, a fish, you know, named after a fish that swims up your urethra. So that's, you know, they think they're pretty badass because nobody's caught them, and sure, you know, no one has discussed their malware in the wild. Nobody has at least publicly reported seeing their malware in the wild. And I imagine it's because it's tough. It's got to be pretty tough to find their stuff. Except, you know, when you look at something from Signature 44, you know, you have this sort of mass of code and, and strings and whatnot, but what happens if we enhance a little bit and enhance and enhance and enhance? So if you're doing a wonderful lawful intercept with your amazing code base, I would suggest not putting a company name within sort of the RTTI descriptors. Just a thought. I guess we'll never know where Kandiru is. So moving on. One last one for the road for what time we've got um, and hopefully leave some time for questions. I actually think I'm kind of speeding through a lot of this stuff, so hopefully some interesting questions. Uh, driver list includes instructions for operators, which I think is particularly cool. It's not something that you usually have access to, right? You don't know what a government tells their operators they should do when they run into certain things, right? So it's in the format, you know, if you see this, do that. It doesn't actually give them a lot of context. You don't, when you have a compartmentalized intelligence agency, you don't want the full file list that just says, this is these guys, and this is what we think about them, and this is why we care. No, it just says, please pull back, friendly tool, unknown, no idea what this is, and so on. So as you're looking through this list of 5,000 5, um, names and instructions, there's one in particular that sort of caught um, our eye. It's a file name, and then next to it, all it says is, nothing to see here, carry on. OK, I mean, you know, cool. So I kind of obsessed over this thing for a while. <laughs> Uh, just trying to figure out what it was. It, 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 is, um, it is actually incredibly rare. It, in, I, I think I searched through a combined maybe nine petabytes worth of malware from different companies that allowed me to, plus you know VT and so on. And we found something very rare, something very old, uh, but I think something very, very interesting. So uh, it's something that I call Torch Relay. The structure of Torch Relay is something like this. We were able to recover about you know, three different components. It's essentially one big user land executable installer. Uh, it drops this kernel driver uh, that will go on to create a, um, a device, sort of like a pipe 
um, and then a what they call a canonified DLL, which is just meant to be a user land component that lets them know when there are active connections or not to this kernel driver. So you know they're trying to manage things in a sort of clean way. What's particularly cool about the kernel driver is it actually deploys a Lua VM. I don't know, does that ring any bells for anybody in the crowd, the use of Lua? And all right, we've got a few guys. Um, so what's interesting about using Lua in this sort of active operations is the kind of actors that use Lua are particularly interesting. You get people like Flame or Project Soron from back in the day. Um, however, uh, this thing precedes both of those, uh, the earliest appearance of any of those by at least three years. Um, and the Lua VM itself is actually an earlier version. It's Lua version 5.0, which if anybody has a working decompiler for that, I would be ever grateful for you. Most of the Lua decompilers are 5.1. So it's been kind of a, a big nuisance to try to deal with some of the scripts that we've pulled out of there. So I'll be honest, we're still reversing this piece. You know, I'm st like I said, we haven't finished the research, um, but I'll leave you a glimpse of why I think this thing is particularly interesting. So if you look at some of the sort of uh, binary references stuff, the binary reference is a substring. It's looking uh, for something in particular. And it's, it's sort of an easy to miss one, right? You, it, it's, um, dollar sign loading space space co seems fairly innocuous actually first pass over the sample I didn't even notice it um, but if you write a signature on that specific string with no ambiguity um, you can search over about half a dozen petabytes worth of stuff and there's only one piece of software that references this substring in those six petabytes so you look at the string, the substring, if you look at it within um, this particular binary that sort of pulls up, there's about 30 or 40 different versions of this one piece of software. The string is actually part of loading complete. It's sort of the standard nomenclature of, of um, engineering software distribution. Um, so what software is it? Is anybody familiar with the name Ansys Autodyne by any chance? No engineers, like no standard, you know, civil engineers in the room, I imagine. So it's engineering simulation software, uh, which I think is particularly interesting because this particular engineering simulation software is actually forbidden um, in certain countries under embargo or sanctions list. And it is because it's used for designing nuclear plants. So nothing to see here. Carry on. Um, so, like I said, I kind of breeze through a lot of this stuff, uh, kind of hoping to yeah, get a few, get about 10 minutes for questions. So, if you've got some interesting stuff, please lay it on me. But I hope that that's a half decent attempt at getting some of you into the threat intel space, getting you more interested in some of the malware analysis stuff. It's not just malware analysis, but rather being able to sort of track some of the threat actors, track some of these campaigns, um, and get on top of some of the more interesting folks that you might. Uh, driver lists, the signature files are all out there. Feel free to hit me up if you want to get into this research. There's still a lot to be done there. And with that, very early into questions. Oh, I see someone over there. Definitely. So uh, the, the question, since there's no mic, the question was, um, since Threat Intel is pretty new, um, have we been trolled by any threat actors? I mean, I've been trolled by plenty of other researchers as well. But um, yeah, the Threat Intel industry, as it exists within the private sector, really came about as of 2010, 2011. Uh, so it is sort of a fairly nascent industry. More to your question, we do have some really interesting interactions with threat actors a lot of the time. So there's people who have put like death threats. Um, I know that not in our case in particular, but uh, there's at least Dr. Webb had somebody throw a Molotov cocktail into one of their offices once. Uh, more on the <laughs> software side of the house, um, you get interesting interactions like when the summer of 2016 election stuff was happening, one of the sock puppet um, accounts that Sophocy put up was something called Anon Poland, like Anonymous Poland. 
Uh, they have us all on some kind of list because when they hacked the Bradley Foundation and when they hacked WAS, uh, sorry, WADA and TASCAST, the uh, um, Tribunal for Sport and some of the Olympics-based hacking that Sophie did and then tried to leak, when they wanted to leak that information, they started tweeting at me, at some of the other researchers involved, and some of the other people in the news. They were hoping that we would actually amplify the message for them. Now, more on the trolling side, you get into some interesting things like, um, I wrote this paper uh, three years ago about false flags and malware. Um, you'll get into things like uh, investigating Turla operations, Turla believed to be a Russian group, um, and all of a sudden when they see some of the incident response tooling come in, uh, they'll just start dropping Chinese malware into some of these boxes that has nothing to do with them while they clean up some of their other operations. Um, you get into some interesting things like um, Cloud Atlas has peppered their malware with strings from a bunch of different languages in different countries, hoping that we'll kind of like get diverted into different ways. So there are some good dynamics. I think CrowdStrike's probably had some of the nicer interactions <laughs> with threat actors where they've actually gotten called out in, in not nice ways online. But, you know, that's the cat and mouse game. That's what you're going to do. Some governments know to just kind of, you know, keep their mouth shut and just move on. Others will actively troll and, you know, mess with you. But they haven't killed any of us yet, as far as I know. So that's still fun. Yes. Thank you. So can you please elaborate more on the DLL dropped by the executable installer for Torch Relay? Uh, sure. So actually, let me think. To the extent that I can, it is actually a, a, a relatively standard use within sort of the XP days. Like the malware is designed for some fairly old boxes. So the notion of what the DLL is supposed to do is it exports just enough functionality for user land components to be able to um, reach the kernel driver without having to do anything suspicious. So there are no hooks or sort of things to mess with the general integrity of the system. What it's going to do is um, allow some of the functionality to be activated for the Lua VM from user land components. I won't pretend to understand the full structure of it yet. We're still reversing it. I'm having a really hard time decompiling some of the Lua stuff because there are, despite there being ready-made tools for 5.0, they just do not handle these scripts well. Uh, but more, most of the actual malware payload functionality is being deployed within Lua scripts the way that you see with Flame. And what this seems to be doing is this one relatively innocuous DLL is just managing the connections between the Lua VM, the stuff that goes into memory, uh, without there having to be any wonkiness that might um, sort of destabilize the system. Um, like I said, it's super rare. We found these three samples that are interconnected. You know, they, they come from the same executable. Um, and then I found one additional driver, which is 100% same code, just slightly, you know, different hash. Uh, but whatever this stuff was, it was deployed very selectively. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't know. Oh, please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, good talk. Um, have you tried uh, graphing any of these relationships um, along with like the negative relationships in terms of like AV emulator offset loads and things like that to see what clusters might be related and what information you might be missing? So we've used a few different ways to try to cluster some of this stuff. Um, I'll be honest with you, uh, at least from a general threat intel perspective, clustering, automated clustering doesn't tend to give us very good results. Um, for example, you have a lot of uh, very common tooling across different actors. Very go-to e go easy examples, things like COBOL Strike or Mimikatz get dropped by multiple different groups. Uh, from an automated perspective, they are exactly the same or for the most part, pretty much the same. So you see these clusters arise, but what they end up doing is muddying the water because they end up connecting a lot of groups that have nothing to do with each other. So in few cases, like, and this might be kind of going at low-hanging fruit to answer your question, but you'll get things like with Mimikatz, uh, Turla has a custom packer that they use, um, or APT34 has a custom packer that they use for Mimikatz. But apart from that, most other groups, like financial groups and so on, they drop Mimikatz straight out the box, normal as it goes. And then what you get is from an automated clustering perspective, which VirusTotal does automatically on all malware that comes in, um, you have one giant cluster of stuff. 
from a threat intel perspective, what you've just done is pulled in the operations of you know, 20, 30 different countries, a bunch of different financial actors, a bunch of script kitties, everybody just got pulled together into the same pot. So the clustering doesn't help a whole lot. What we end up doing is different types of clustering, like uh, uh, automated generation of signatures based on code similarity, sorry, or... Sorry, that, that wasn't the... Um, I, oh, was, sorry. I was meaning graphing the relationships. So clearly you've, you've identified from those signatures that mm -hmm. some groups have a, uh, a neutral, a negative, or a positive relationship with another group. Not really, but... Please keep in mind that the relationships are coming about from an analyst perspective. It's, it's not a technical relationship for a lot of it, right? So what you get into with things like these rootkits that we were discussing for Signature 30. If an analyst goes through, looks through, finds, for example, the put-in page, finds the source code, finds the account, the account from an OSINT perspective will allow you to connect some of these things. But the code itself doesn't. So you get into a situation where graphing those relationships as far as our analysis go, it's like from an I2 analyst notebook perspective, you can do it. But from a technical perspective, you get these giant gaps that you need a human to kind of jump over. So there's that. There's also the fact that the signatures from one signature to another have very little in common whatsoever. So you have these microcosms that you need to map, but you don't have a general relationship to work with. So, I mean, maybe I'm missing sort of the general thrust of, of what you're discussing, but uh, it's been very hard to take this from a, um, a more macro perspective in that sense. Thank you all for the questions, by the way. I didn't mean to blast through the talk quite so quickly at 10 a.m. You uh, alluded to it a little bit on the slide and with the name, but can you speak to uh, where the torch re relay sample was found, like the context in which it was found, or maybe what you suspect the intention may have been from the malware? So um, I can speculate, which I would rather not, but I can at least say that it was found somewhere in the Middle East, and um, or it was uploaded from somewhere in the Middle East, and there is some fancy AV in the middle of that, haven't actually caught it, it wasn't, like that's one of the difficult things with having a submission platform for malware. Um, things that people can find on their own tend to not be interesting things. So I actually have a lot of appreciation for AV companies that you know, detect interesting things and then submit them to a platform. Uh, because this, at no point, I believe, was in front of a user. It just sort of got installed, deployed, and sort of was there. Um, now, as for what it is doing, I get the sense that once we finish unwrapping this onion, what we'll likely see is pulling the files that are getting designed using Ansys Autodyne. That's my guess. My guess is that it's looking for this, and because the string loading complete, it's, it is, as it is announcing, when Ansys Autodyne is finished loading a sort of a modeling map. My guess is in a science fiction way, maybe they're modifying it, but I think for the most part, they're just pulling uh, those maps entirely and uploading them. So uh, given the era of when Torch Relay would have been around, sorry, 2005, um, it, that would place us right at the beginning of what was considered Olympic Games, but again, that's a lot of speculation and I'd rather not you know, like put on that very heavily. I appreciate you answering the question, thank you. Um, you, oh, the slides are gone. Uh, so my email was up there, or Twitter uh, is fine. Yeah, if you, if you have a, a working decompiler for Lua 5.0. Uh, I've, I've tried Lua Ret and a couple of other things that are out there. Uh, so far it hasn't worked, but it would make our lives a lot easier. Like I, uh, Silas Cutler, if any of you know him, has been sort of breaking his head against this thing for a bit. He's an amazing reverse engineer, and I'm sure he hates me for finding some of this stuff, but... Uh, anything that can make his day a little easier is appreciated. So on that, I think, thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate everybody waking up and...